Welcome to Torah Today Ministries and our continuing series, Tehillim Talks, our studies in the Psalms. And I've lost count of how many times I've introduced one of these with, this is my new favorite psalm. But here I go again with Psalm 45, my new favorite psalm. I call this psalm a song for Messiah's wedding. And it is the only psalm out of the 150 that is a love song. It's addressed to the king. And it describes the king and his bride. But I get ahead of myself. So let's just dive right in and look at the attribution. To the choir master, according to Shoshanim. Shoshanim is a Hebrew word that means lilies or some translators roses. But whatever Shoshanim is referring to, it's, it's probably a melody that this psalm is to be sung to. Some suggest that maybe it's a particular kind of instrument or instrumentation that the psalm is to be performed to. But regardless, the word means lilies or roses. It's a maskil, which means it's a teaching psalm by the sons of Korah. And again, the only psalm that is called a love song. Now, the psalm is easily divided into two halves. Uh, the first half is to the king. And I list seven attributes of the king that I see here. And you might number them differently, divide them a little differently, but it's just for convenience and to help emphasize some of the characteristics of this king. Then the second half is to the bride. And I list seven attributes of the bride in the same way. But the first verse and the last verse of the psalm are the poet speaking basically to the reader introducing the psalm and then bringing the psalm to conclusion. So in verse 1, the poet is speaking and says, My heart is astir with a pleasing theme. I address my verses to the king. This is the only psalm that has something like this at the front. Because all of the other psalms, if there are any exceptions, I'm not sure what they are. But the other psalms address themselves to God. They're sung to God, they're praises to God, but... Here, the author is saying, I'm addressing these words to the king. And then the question is, who is the king? Well, over the centuries, commentators have, different, have had different uh, opinions about this. Uh, some say he's referring to King David, some to King Solomon. Some commentators, you might be surprised at, at the ones who do this, but they say the king here is actually the Torah scholar. The person who dedicates her life to studying God's word, teaching it and living it out. But I believe the king in view here is King Messiah. And of course, over the centuries, many rabbis have said the same. But I'm going to be very emphatic that it is definitely King Messiah because, as we'll see shortly, the writer of Hebrews tells us that this is referring to King Messiah himself. But with that said, going back to Torah scholars, if you've devoted your life to studying God's Word, teaching it, living it out, then you should be one who reflects King Messiah. You should be bearing God's image. And so to a degree, you are reflecting Messiah, but even more so the Bride of Messiah. So, with that in mind, let's continue. So, the king, verse 2. The first attribute here is his blessing from God. You are the most beautiful of the sons of Adam. Some translations may say the most handsome, because it sounds more masculine. But the word here is Yaffa, which is consistently translated beautiful in other passages. So, you're the most beautiful of the sons of Adam. Grace is poured upon your lips. Some translations say grace pours forth from your lips. Both are okay. Literally, it says upon your lips. But it's a picture here that if grace is poured upon his lips, then when he speaks, grace comes from his lips. The grace is poured upon him from God, and as he speaks, grace goes forth in his speech. Therefore, God has blessed you forever. And there's a principle here. If our speech is filled with grace, I think we will experience a, a heightened sense of blessing 
from God. Let's try to be as gracious in our speech as we can be. Second attribute, his truth and righteousness. Gird your sword on your thigh, O mighty one, and your majesty and splendor. Now here the sword is mentioned, and in just another verse or two, arrows are mentioned. We're going to compare these two weapons. But gird your sword on your thigh, O Gibor, O mighty one, in your hod and hador. Hod v'hador, majesty and splendor. Usually you find these two terms together. We'll find them, uh, encounter them again in the Psalms as we go through. But uh, hod and hador, they're very similar. And here I've translated them majesty and splendor. Other translators will say splendor and majesty. Some will say authority and majesty or something to this effect. But when you see hod and hador, we're talking about something that's really something to see. Now, what's interesting here, and I believe is a hint as to who this king is, is that the first time we encounter the word majesty or our hod in the scriptures is in Numbers chapter, um, chapter 27. And this is where God instructs Moses to lay his hands on Joshua. This is what it says. You shall invest him, Joshua, with some of your hod, your majesty, that all the congregation of the people of Israel may obey. So the first time we encounter this word in the scriptures is Mo uh, Moses. It's implied that he has hod. He has this, this majesty, this authority, this kingship about him. And God wants him to transfer some of that to Joshua or Yeshua, which is Joshua's Hebrew name. And I think here we have a hint as to who this king is. He is Yeshua, the one who is endowed with the majesty of Moses himself and the glory of God himself and is infused with God's spirit to carry forth God's mission in the world. Verse 4. In your hode, there's the word again, in your majesty, ride out victorious, victoriously for the cause of, number one, truth, second, meekness, third, righteousness. Truth, meekness, and righteousness. And we could say truth, humility, and righteousness. These are three words that, to me, definitely describe Yeshua. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Everything he said and did was a reflection of truth itself. There was no deception, no distortion in anything he said or did. But he is absolutely humble. He came to serve God and to serve us. He laid down his life for those around him. So he's incredibly humble and sinless. He was righteous. He never failed. He never stumbled. He did everything exactly right. So truth, meekness, or humility, and righteousness to me describe our Messiah. Let your right hand teach you awesome deeds or awesome things. What is the right hand? The right hand, which will be over here for you, is always the spiritual. And the left is always the physical. And in Messiah, we see the spiritual and the physical blended perfectly. But Yeshua operated and was motivated and inspired by the right hand, by the spiritual. And everything he did flowed from the spiritual into the physical. He heard from God and then he spoke it forth. He saw what God did and then he did it himself in the physical world. Everything comes from the spiritual and the physical. So when it says, let your right hand teach you, it means the source of what you do and the source of what you say comes from the right hand. Let it teach you awesome deeds. So as Yeshua walked in the spirit, he performed awesome deeds. He did awesome things. Third, his victory. Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. So we've seen the sword back in verse 3, and now we see the arrows. What's the difference between these two weapons of war, sword and arrows? Well, 
Sword is for close combat. Arrows are for taking care of enemies at a distance that are away from us in space and in time because it takes some time for the arrow. It could take several seconds for it to reach its target. But the tip of the arrow, the arrowhead, is a two-edged blade just like a sword is in the hand. So we can think of arrows as being little swords sent out into space and into time to accomplish the same thing that the sword does. Now when we see the sword in Scripture, we should think of the Word of God. For the Word of God is sharp and powerful. The Word of God is it's sharper than a two-edged sword. And in the armor that's described, it calls the sword of the Spirit the Word of God. And when Mount Sinai uh, comes into view in the Torah and God speaks the Torah from Mount Sinai, you recall that Mount Sinai is also called Mount Chorev. Chorev is the Hebrew word for sword. So the Torah was given to Moses on Mount Sword. So when we see the sword, we think of God's, God's mighty word. And it's there to destroy the enemy, not your brother, not your sister, but the enemy. And what is our enemy? Falsehood, because God's word is true and it destroys falsehood. It's there to destroy ego because God uses the sword in my life to reveal what's me and what's him, what's my own ego, what's my pride, and then what is his ways. It's there to destroy darkness. It's there to destroy enmity. And when someone hates you without a cause, they're believing a lie. And the way God destroys enemies and the way we should destroy enemies is by making an enemy a friend, by destroying the thing that stands between us. If it's possible to live at peace with someone, use the Word of God and walk in the Word of God to destroy the thing that this person believes. Because if what they believed about you was true, I'd probably hate you too. But people believe lies and we use the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to destroy lies. And thus we can make an enemy a friend. A great example of that is, is the Apostle Paul himself. He was an enemy of God. He was an enemy of those who followed Messiah. And yet he became Yeshua's greatest advocate there in the book of Acts. So we destroy enemies by making them friends. We find the thing that's between us, the lies they're believing, or the lies we're believing about them. We apply the sword of truth to that. And that's done through the sword of the Spirit. It can also be done through the arrows. You know, I have enemies, people hate me who don't know me or they believe lies about me. But even after I'm dead, hopefully, things I've said and recorded may go through time and space to eventually change their hearts. Because how do the arrows work? Your arrows are sharp in the heart of the king's enemies. The peoples fall under you. So by changing the heart, by truth piercing the heart, and the heart is softened and changed, that's how we conquer those who are living in the delusion and darkness of lies, through the truth of God's Word. Well, let's move on. Now, I have a rectangle around the word arrows because uh, there's something interesting coming up here in verse 6, but let's get through verse 5 first, uh, uh, verse 6, uh, first half of verse 6. I'll get it right eventually. It says, uh, it speaks of his divinity. Your throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. Now, Elohim is always a problematic word because Elohim can refer to God himself. It can refer to angels. It's a plural word. And it can also refer to judges. We've discussed this in, in past teachings. And there are a number of places where judges, human judges, who sit on a panel to hear a case, these judges are called Elohim. It's almost as if wherever some entity, angelic, 
or human is exercising the power and authority of God, they're called Elohim. It doesn't mean they're God, but they're exercising this power and God-given authority. So the question here is, how is this being used? Your throne, O Elohim, is forever and ever. Well, the writer of Hebrews quotes this verse, and you'll find this quote in Hebrews chapter 1. And I'm, for the sake of context, I'm going to read from 7 through 9. Hebrews 1, starting in verse 7. And of the angels, God says, he says, quote, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire, unquote. But of the Son, this is the Son of God, Messiah, he says, quote, Your throne, O God, Elohim, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of his kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with oil of gladness above your companions. So we see here that the writer of Hebrews sees verse 6 as pointing squarely at King Messiah. Now, the fifth attribute is his anointing and rule. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of uprightness. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. I'm going to have to pause there just for a second. You know, I know people who love righteousness, but they don't hate wickedness. And I know some people who hate wickedness, but they don't love righteousness. We need to make sure we are balanced in this. We need to see white as white and black as black, good as good and bad as bad. Not just see one or the other. We need to understand both of them. And we must reflect upon both of these. We've seen this before in the Psalms uh, and how God praises the man who hates wickedness. Hating wickedness is something that a righteous person must do to truly be a righteous person. So uh, let's make sure that we emulate Messiah in this. Let's make, be very careful that before we decide to hate wickedness, we recognize that what we're hating is truly something wicked, not something that we're deluded about, lest we find ourselves coming in the air of calling good evil and evil good. We don't want to do that. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness. Of course, the word anoint is the word mashach, and that's where we get the word mashiach, Messiah. He has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. So, why do I have scepter in a rectangle here? Earlier, I had the word arrows. Here, I have the word scepter. Well, many of you may realize and, and know that in Judaism, there is a controversy about the Messiah. And the controversy arises because in the Tanakh, we see prophecies about a Messiah coming who is a conquering king riding on a horse. And he comes with weapons and he drives out Israel's enemies and establishes kingdom of peace. But then we see other prophecies in the Tanakh about how the Messiah comes humble, riding on a donkey. And he's rejected and despised of men. And he's rejected by his brothers like, like Joseph was. And so they look at these two kinds of prophecies and they say, well, how can Messiah fulfill this and this? How can he come as a conquering king, but then come lowly riding on a donkey? And so they came up with a theory that possibly there are two messiahs. And they call the one Messiah, the conquering king, they call him Mashiach ben David, Messiah, the son of David, because David was a warrior, a king, and a conqueror. And they call this other Messiah, Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph, because as I mentioned, Joseph was rejected by his brothers, was not recognized by them. And then only much later did he reveal himself to them as their brother. Well, we know that we're not talking about two messiahs. We're talking about the same messiah, but coming at two points in time. And the first time Yeshua came, he came as Mashiach ben Yosef, Messiah, son of Joseph. In fact, Mary's husband was named Joseph. So Yeshua's adoptive father was Joseph. 
And when he returns, he will return as a conquering king, as Mashiach ben David. So again, why do I have scepter? And why do I have arrows in, in rectangles? Well, the first time you find the word arrows, and the first time you find the word scepter, are in the same chapter of Genesis, Genesis 49, the first time they appear. And this is the chapter where Jacob, on his deathbed, is pronouncing a prophecy and blessing over each of his sons. And when he speaks of Joseph, he talks about how arrows will be fired at him, and that's the first appearance of the word arrows in the Bible. And when he speaks of Judah, he says the scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh, until the Messiah arrives. So the first appearances of arrows and scepter is in the prophecies over Joseph and Judah. So who is the king? I think the psalmist, whether he realized it or not, was leaving us some hints that this king is King Messiah, the son of Joseph, the son of David, the conqueror and also the humble deliverer coming on the back of a donkey. Continuing now with, with verse 8, his sixth attribute is his attire, myrrh, aloes, and cassia, or cassia, I'm not sure how it's pronounced, are the fragrance of all your garments. From ivory palaces, stringed instruments make you glad. Myrrh, aloes, and cassia. This is the first time cassia, in fact, the only time cassia is mentioned in the Bible. The first time aloes is mentioned in the Bible, but myrrh we find many times in Scripture. In fact, when Messiah was born, uh, the, the wise men brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, a very, very expensive fragrance. And myrrh was part of the anointing oil, the incense, and so on, that uh, we find in the tabernacle. And the sages say that a person's garments, when we find them in the scriptures, is an allegory for the person's character. And if we think of Messiah and his garments being an expression of his character, uh, a, a, a metaphor for his character, then his character is fragrant. And, um, and it's something beautiful, something pure. His entourage. Now you'll notice the little uh, red dotted line onto the left here because this first uh, this first phrase is very problematic and you if you look in different translations they're all over the place on this and I can't quite make heads or tails of it but I've settled on this which seems to be kind of an average of most of the translations I see but it's a very complex passage to translate daughters of kings are among your precious ones so whatever you make of that good luck but you get the feel here that the daughters of kings these are princesses are among your precious ones and that's where the the real problem is who are the precious ones um, whoever these people are these people who are following the king they themselves are royalty and they are the daughters of kings so make of it what you will but now we meet the queen, the bride. Erect stands the queen at your right hand in gold of Ophir. Now to me, gold is gold is gold, but the Bible talks about gold, then it talks about the gold of Ophir, uh, because Ophir, somehow its gold was superior to all other gold. It was worth more than other gold. I'm not quite sure how that works, but gold of Ophir, it doesn't get better than that. And now we meet the queen, the bride. The first attribute is her redemption. Now look at this, verse 10. Hear, daughter, and see. Third, incline your ear. And fourth, forget your people and your father's house. We notice here that this is a foreign bride. Because otherwise, why would she be told to forget her people and her father's house? And she's told to shema, to hear, and to see, to incline her ear. In other words, we want you to forget where you came from and begin to see and to hear and to obey and enter into this whole new realm that you're becoming a part of. 
Isn't that the way it is with all believers? We have to leave those things that are behind and we have to face with courage and joy what lies before us. If we want to be part of the bride of Messiah, we've got to leave and to cleave. We have to forget what's behind and move on to what's ahead. And that's how the bride here, the queen, is introduced. This is number one. Second, we see her devotion. Then the king will desire your beauty, for he is your Lord. Bow to him. Notice it says, then the king will desire your beauty. Unless you and I are willing to leave what's behind and go forward hearing and obeying and seeing and moving towards something that is we're invited to to come into then god's not going to desire our beauty we're not going to be part of his bride we want to be part of his bride third her preeminence the daughter of tyre will seek your favor with gifts the richest of the people when we see Tyre in the Bible, it wasn't necessarily a righteous or godly place. It seemed to go up and down in that regard. But it was a very wealthy people up in the north and, and the west of Israel. And um, this is where Solomon got the timbers and, uh, and the gold and precious stones that were used in building his temple. It's also where David got the timbers um, and the building materials for his own house. So here the daughter of Tyre is going to seek the favor of the queen and bring gifts to her. But this is the verse that just really, I think, is incredible. Verse 13, the king's daughter is all glorious within. The king's daughter. The bride is called the king's daughter. Now, don't get me wrong. There's no incest going on here. Uh, but there's some great spiritual imagery that the king is marrying the daughter of the king. Messiah is marrying the daughter of the king. And um, her glory is all internal. The king's daughter is glorious within. You know, in this world, we encounter the bride of Messiah in the form of elderly people, crippled and weak people, people who may not have as high an IQ as we think they should have, or people who are poor or destitute, whose, uh, whose lives seem pretty simple and unaccomplished and unrefined. But they only seem that way because their glory is all internal. We need to learn the ability to look into the hearts of people and not be deceived by what we see on the outside. You know, as Solomon wrote, a, a beautiful woman who lacks discretion is like a gold ring in the snout of a pig. Don't be distracted by the gold ring, the beauty, the external beauty, and miss the essence of what's inside. Because you might be attracted to the beauty of one thing and find out inside it's a pig. On the other hand, you might be repulsed by external lack of beauty, but inside it's all glory. Let's not be deceived. But look at the next phrase. More than the golden settings is her raiment. Now that phrase doesn't seem to make much sense. But the key is the word for golden settings. And I've written it here in Hebrew. Mish batzot. Mish batzot. That word is found nine times in the Bible. This is the only place it appears in Psalms. The other eight times it appears in the Bible <clears throat> are all in the book of Exodus. And they're all found in Exodus chapters 28 and 29. Eight times in Exodus 28 and 29. And then here in Psalms, describing the raiment of the king's bride. So, how does it appear those eight times in Exodus 28 and 29? In the clothing of the high priest. If you recall, the high priest wore a cushion, a, a breastplate with 12 stones, having the 12 tribes of Israel's names on them. And they were set in settings of gold. 
The word for those settings is mishbatzot. And then on his, uh, the high priest's shoulders would be a stone with six names over here. And on the other shoulder, a stone with the other six names. And they were also set in settings of gold, mishbatzot. So eight times this word appears in the Torah. It's mishbatzot, the golden settings, in the high priest's garments. And then this one last time, number nine, here, describing the bride of the king. Now, on earth, there's simply no one who is higher and considered to be closer to God than the high priest. But the Kohen Hagadol, the high priest, the word Kohen, you have to realize, is a word that means to serve. It's a verb as well as a noun means to serve. Well, I can tell you one thing, it's higher than the high priest. That's the bride. And here the bride is wearing something that has gold settings in it. And Rashi himself says that these gold settings are connected to the high priest, that her garments are even more glorious than those of the high priest. What an amazing, amazing picture. Now, something I was going to share at the end, but I'm going to, this is a good place to insert it. And maybe some of you have been picking up on this as we go through this psalm, and we're almost to the end. But you may have seen some, some imagery in this psalm that reminds you of Revelation chapters 21 and 22, the last two chapters of the Bible. And these two chapters describe the bride of Messiah. We see the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God, adorned as a bride for her husband. And this, this bride, this new Jerusalem, is called the Lamb's Wife. And when you see the description of this holy city, this place of the bride's residence, we find gold. We find precious stones with the names of the, the, the apostles written on them. We find pearls with the names of the 12 tribes of Israel written on them. And we find a, a lot of things that are very similar to the imagery we find here about the bride. So I'm going to encourage you now, uh, as soon as this teaching is over, go and carefully read Revelations 21 and 22. Incredible chapters to describe our future, the future of the king and his bride. And then verse 5, I'm sorry, verse 14, the first half, her clothing and many colored robes she has led to the king. Then her entourage, her virgin friends follow after her. Now let me drop something in here. You've heard me refer to Rashi many times, considered to be the greatest Bible commentator in Jewish history, Rashi. Uh, Rashi stands for Rabbi Shalomo Yisrael. And uh, you know what he says about these virgin friends who they are? He says these virgin friends are a reference to Zechariah chapter 8, verse 23. This is what it says. Thus says Adonai of hosts, In those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of a Jew, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. In other words, these virgin friends are the people from among the Gentiles who come to God, say, let us uh, come to the, uh, a Jew and say, let us go with you, for we heard that God is with you. He's describing the bride and people attaching themselves to her because they know by following her, they come to God. By following her, they'll come to a place of Torah. They'll come into the presence of the king. Pretty amazing claim for this ultra-Orthodox Jewish commentator. But anyways, her virgin friends follow after her. They are led to you. With joy and gladness, they are led along as they enter the palace of the king. So people who are following the bride find themselves in the place of the king. Are you part of the bride of Messiah? Are people who are looking to you and following your steps Will they find themselves coming into the presence of the king as well? How are you leading them? Then number seven, her future. In place of your fathers 
shall be your sons. You will make them princes in all the earth. Very cryptic verse. In place of your father, so here's the bride, here are her fathers that she was descended from. And in place of the father shall be her sons, those who come from her. But the thing is, in the kingdom, are Messiah and the bride going to be having children? There's no place in the Bible that mentions this, except this kind of a cryptic allusion to something like that. But it says that her sons will take the place of her fathers. The father she was told to forget and to leave. It's almost as if she is coming to the king from a foreign place of people who don't know God, who don't know the king. But she's leaving them because she loves the king. She accepts his invitation to be his bride. But her children replace her father's. Who are these children? It's almost as if, as C.S. Lewis puts it, the good news of the gospel works backwards. And those who rejected Messiah in the past will come to him in the future. And when you read Revelation 21, it describes the bride. Here she is, the new Jerusalem. And describes the 12 gates and says, its gates will never be shut for there's no night there. And then it says, the kings of the earth bring their glory to the city. Well, who are these guys? Where did they come from? They're not part of the bride. But the kings of the earth, those who somehow did not become part of the bride, maybe they're the five foolish virgins who didn't put oil on their lamp. They just didn't prepare themselves for Messiah's return. But the kings of the earth bring their glory into the city to do homage to the bride and to her husband, the king. It's a big thought. It's just a thought. And then the poet has the last word in verse 17. I will cause your name, and the your is masculine, so the poet is not talking to the queen anymore. The poet is talking to the king and telling us, I will cause your name to be remembered in all generations, that the peoples, the Gentiles, will do homage to you forever and ever. What a glorious ending to a glorious song. I know I, I, I feel frustrated, you can probably sense it, because this psalm kind of overwhelms me. This psalm kind of, it almost takes me out of the book of the Psalms and, and puts me into a future place to see the grand future that awaits us. And um, it's frustrating to try to, to, to express what I see here in this psalm. But I hope you'll enter into the psalm, meditate on it, study it, and, and go deeply into it. Read Revelation 21 and 22. And I think then you might get just as excited as I am. So, until next time, I wish you shalom and may God bless. Thank you for joining us for today's teaching. If the work of Torah Today Ministries has touched your life, please consider making a donation or sponsoring an upcoming video. As a video sponsor, you'll have an exclusive opportunity to memorialize a family member, celebrate a special event, or simply support the ongoing creation of similar content. Your tax-deductible contribution helps ensure that our teachings continue to reach all who are longing for truth. Click the link or visit our website to learn more. Amen!